There was always this fantasy um, to just design whatever vehicle I, I can imagine. Uh, a, uh, a hydrofoil boat, uh, a, a rocket ship, uh, a submarine. So I have all these ideas flying around and my office is packed with that stuff. But then you wonder how do you, it needs, it needs a package, like how does this all fit together? Um, and I have Cosmic Motors, which is playing in space and in some undefined time. And I thought it would be cool to have a second uh, IP that is more related to Earth, just what we do here. Um, so I had all these ideas, hmm, an old vehicle, uh, a new machine, future past, and then somehow this whole time travel came into play. That was pretty much the only chance to deal with it. Um, then my time in the movie industry told me some lessons that you, you better have a clear hero in your story. And uh, yeah, also something just that, that makes sense in the most simple way. Um, I don't know if I cracked that one, <laughs> other people have to decide. So I came up with these, again, 699 years of racing. So there's this Italian manufacturer who has been controversial through all those centuries. Uh, but they need this one hero driver uh, over those 700 years. So yes, he must time travel somehow. And uh, it's also because I thought in terms of final products, I thought it would be nice to have all those machines with the same number. So um, the number 13 was very intriguing because in, in some societies it's the unlucky number. For my racer, it's the lucky one. He gets this from his father. Um, and yeah, he appears in 1952 or in 2512 and races in a Masuchi. It's funny, like this morning I, I woke up and thought um, how crazy I was about sketching when I uh, was at school and when I actually left school and I thought sketching rules the world. And I, there is a certain truth in it because uh, a sketch starts uh, every process in a way. But man, I spent the whole day on email today and thought like, Jesus, where's, why didn't I do a single sketch today? And I realized how much more there is to design than just do a drawing. And uh, you know, I like to uh, uh, talk to students about this also that later in your career, when you try, uh, try to build a business or you really try to get something out there, the, the sketch is just a very little first step and there's so much after this coming. And even if it's management and paperwork, uh, not even talking about the, the modeling and the, how difficult it is to translate something into 3D. Uh, I see a, young, a lot of young artists struggling to translate their sketch into something that looks as appealing in 3D. And you never stop learning, right? And uh, I remember when I started at Volkswagen, I saw managers or my design bosses and I thought, Jesus, when have they sketched for the last time? They completely lost it. And now, when you get older, you find yourself almost in this position uh, where you realize it takes so much more to make a cool product. Um, like, this is not a car, but just for the book, how much email writing and, and negotiation there is involved to get, uh, yeah, let's say the, to have Top Gear write something on the back of it, right? It, it's easily said, but then you really need to get people excited about your stuff. So you can't just send a drawing, you need like the proper presentation of things and then you follow up and then you think, oh my God, I still have to figure out the layout of it. What's the size, what paper type, who built it, when does it ship? And then you realize, okay, sketch is cool, but there's, <laughs> there's a little bit more to do. And I enjoy that, but uh, yeah, I have to go back to sketching very soon again because I miss that a lot. There's also uh, almost a, a paradox that when I left Volkswagen, um, there was the notion of, I may never really build a cool prototype again or a cool show car, this is all gone, now it's all digital and virtual. But when we worked on Oblivion, we built this ridiculous full-size bubble ship for Tom Cruise. And I tell you, that was, that was full on uh, like Candyland. No, that was like really working for a big car maker and, and putting a prototype, uh, like car show prototype together, yet it had big jet engines and, and uh, crazy landing gear and all this stuff. Um, oh, you learn so much on a film production. It's so high time pressure <laughs> and expectations. Uh, uh, well, what would you learn? Um, 
I learned uh, to be very organized, <laughs> to, uh, to uh, work in a team. You're, you're really sitting uh, amongst uh, amazing artists who all have a different specialty. That's, that's I think, the, the biggest difference to a car design studio. In a car design studio, you sit amongst others like you. So, you know, you talk about a fender reflection and the next person knows exactly what you mean. Uh, we in an art department, there, the next guy might be a, a specialist on monsters and the next guy on costumes and the next guy does magic stuff on Photoshop that I've never seen before. Uh, I learned about the importance of silhouettes. For example, when I worked with Ridley Scott, he's all about the outline and the silhouette of a vehicle. He, he shoots a lot of backlit. So all you see is the profile of, of the design. Uh, you only fill that in later. Um, what's also interesting is that many producers, uh, producers want to see your design right away as if it was ready. Like uh, I remember a moment where I didn't, it was probably after two or three days, and I, I didn't put dirt on it. Um, and yeah, the comment was not on the design or on the stands or on the wheel size. It was like, mm, it should be dirtier. And so these are all very interesting experiences that just make you a more complete artist over the years. Each director works so differently that uh, only if you work with a director twice or the third time, then, then it's a smooth pro process. Well, motor racing is just awesome. There's nothing bad about it at all. Um, it's a lot of people who want to be first. Uh, it's a lot of people who think being second is really bad and that already creates an atmosphere that is just full of drama and, and, and stories. Um, it's, it's funny, it's hard to bring on the screen, like a lot of racing movies are really hard to pull off, but I think in books it translates really well. And the, the passion, the idea for the Timeless Racer was pretty much born when I went through all my books, I just love to collect them. And you, let's say you read a book about uh, you know, Ferrari in the 60s or Formula One from the 80s to the 90s or the Turbo era. It's like you read those and you notice, oh my God, there's so much richness in each year, in each episode. Why did this team not win? And who, who was this terrible team boss? And why did this driver uh, tragically die? And then I realized there must be a day when you have all those books. <laughs> Where can, there cannot be written anything new. And I thought, huh, but maybe, maybe you can create a book where you make all this up and just add to that collection of books that people have. Uh, this was one part of the motivation for the Timeless Racer, to, be, to create a fully detailed racing world, but that's all made up. But so intriguing and detailed that a real race car driver would still accept it to not be complete bollocks. And I thought, damn, I want to write that book right now. <laughs> so this is how the idea was born to write a story about uh, 699 years of racing. Pick one uh, maker, Italian, why not? Uh, give it the name Masucci, which is the name of my wife's grandfather. And he is, uh, has Italian roots, perfect. And it, it, it all started from there. This book project was massive because it's just episode one, so I developed pretty much already episode one, two, three somehow, because they all make, have to make sense once they come out. And so there were about 4,500 hours in the first one, so I couldn't lift this all by myself. And I met uh, a 3D modeler, his name is Joe Hira, on uh, Tron Legacy and also in Oblivion, who's just a master in, in you know, 3D design and, and we function really good together so he helped me a lot building those cars because they are freaking detailed I mean each screw on those guys is a real 3d model so you need a lot of memory a lot of memory on your computer when you create fantasy vehicles that have no purpose or no meaning behind it that's the worst thing that can happen to you you know you, you can't really sit down and draw well, you can, but I can't draw a cool spaceship because that spaceship might just be a random shape that could be awesome. But I, I like the fact of solving problems. I'm an industrial designer uh, back from my education uh, slash transportation design. So I like to solve problems. So you have to create them for yourself. And uh, 
Then you also wonder how can you differentiate things. So maybe uh, if co two cars battle each other, one should maybe visually be a little bit more edgy, the other one maybe a little bit more round. So even that people who are not interested in cars could say like, oh, I like the round one and I like the edgy one, so to speak. Um, I like mistakes in things. Nothing is perfect. So when you design something from scratch, it's so much fun to it, um, create imperfections. Um, and the biggest imperfection actually triggers the whole Masucci saga in the book. I mean, in uh, 1986, uh, sorry, in 1982, um, the Masucci company creates this suction car that's a little bit based on the Chaparrales and Brabham's from the past. And they were so freaking fast that they get ruled out, like it happened also in reality. Uh, but in my story, he puts a huge rear spoiler on it. Um, and the only reason for that is because I wanted to have that big spoiler and that, that wing looked just so awesome, I just needed to find a reason for that. So the reason was perfect. Um, they didn't let him drive the suction version, so here's the big wing. Um, but then the car became so unstable that uh, a famous driver in the story dies in that car because he couldn't handle it. So things, over the months and months and months, things started to fit together. So I had a reason to explain this ridiculous rear wing. I had a reason to explain why the, the car with the fan is only prototype. And I, I love the fact how these things come together. And, and also saying, yes, I designed this car, but it's terrible to drive. Um, and ideas like this, for example, start uh, with reading about the Porsche 917. I mean, that thing was a beast in the beginning. Like, no driver wanted to drive it. Uh, it was so hard to control. And uh, yeah, you know, one driver died in it, and it's all very dramatic. And it just later became something amazing. So flawed stuff is seductive in terms of storytelling. When he asked me what the most challenging thing was, I have to think so hard because everything was trouble. Um, I think what's the most challenging is if you create something that is cohesive, where um, uh, let's say Cosmic Motors. Cosmic Motors was a little bit more of a portfolio book. Um, yes, there is a story, but it's a collection of nine vehicles that don't necessarily have to function together. Um, with a Timeless Racer, I try to create something where everything interacts with each other. So if I do a car that in, uh, from the 80s, it better looks a little bit like the 80s. So it better has a w window wiper on it, uh, like the Porsche 956, for example. They have the big wipers there. By the way, from the Boeing 747, I just learned that. I found it pretty awesome. Uh, those were the only wipers that d don't lift off with, at that, that airspeed. Then, uh, uh, then you say, oh, this car should be the future car, but God damn it, it has, uh, I don't know, it, it has really old school wheel nuts, so I better come with something up that looks more futuristic here. So once you try to give meaning and context to all of your designs, then it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a very hard back and forth process to, to develop everything at the, the same time. When you work so much on a computer, it's, it's, it's hard to really judge a shape. Um, I'm, I'm always surprised if you print something out or mill something, uh, you never write spot on. So I thought before I, I print these for never to go away on paper, um, I, I milled just one of those cars in quarter scale. Uh, I like to do that in, in cheap foam. Put some tapes on it so I, I get the, the contrast and the graphics. And that's good enough for me to, to judge it for this purpose. Uh, long term, of course, I dream to have all of these as little scale models, collectibles. I mean, who doesn't like 18 scale or I'll let it be four scale. Um, so this is the next big dream to have with a book series, also a, a, a toy line, who knows.